Hi and welcome to the All Plane podcast where we talk with the movers and shakers that are redefining the future of commercial aviation. As usual, before we start, let me remind you once more that all previous episodes of this podcast as well as many other aviation stories are available on the All Plane website. That's allplane.tv, A-L-L-P-L-A-N-E.tv. Now, on this podcast, as it could not be otherwise, this being obviously a channel focusing on technology and innovation in the aviation industry, we often talk about new aircraft concepts, and there is no shortage of them. Just in the eVTOL space alone, we are talking at this moment of several hundred projects. We would possibly need to go back about a hundred years to the very early years of aviation, to come across such an explosion of, of creativity and entrepreneurship in the aviation industry. But how many of these new aircraft concepts do really stand a chance to go through the whole certification process? This is a topic, certification, I must confess I know very little about. This is why this episode has been produced in collaboration with Afusion, a boutique consultancy firm that helps aviation firms get through the challenging certification process. Our guest today is Affusion's founder and CEO, Vance Hilderman, who is an entrepreneur, author of technical books about aircraft certification, and one of the top experts in this field. With Vance, we review the main elements and timeframes involved in getting a new aircraft type certified, and we pay particular attention to the eVTOL space, which is obviously one of the areas that is seeing the most activity right now. How is the certification process like? What sort of time frame can the applicants expect? And very importantly, how much does it cost? And how they can mitigate the risks involved in the certification process by getting expert advice from firms like Affusion. So tune in for an in-depth conversation about one of the most important and yet often overlooked aspects of new aircraft design. Let me welcome Vance Hilderman to the podcast. Hello, Vance. How are you? Mikhail, I'm terrific. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good good morning to you because you are joining us from <laughs> California today. And I'm in, I'm in Europe where it's starting to get dark now at this time of the year. But, uh, yeah, I, I just uh, wanted to welcome you to the podcast because you are an expert. Uh, now we're going to go over your, your very impressive background because you are what I would call a serial entrepreneur. You have launched and, and sold several companies and started new companies all the time. You are an expert in aircraft certification, and that's something that in the current context where we are seeing a, a, a whole new generation of aircraft, new types of aircraft that are entirely new uh, in many ways in terms of propulsion, concept, from an operational perspective, that's, that's going to be a very, very important factor that's going to shape this industry. But first of all, tell us in a few words a little bit about your professional background, your previous ventures, and your books, because you've been writing books as well about this topic, about aircraft certification, and also about your current venture, A Fusion, a boutique consultancy firm that basically provides advice on how to get aircraft certified. Oh, very good. I'd be happy to, Miguel. And you know, it's interesting. You mentioned a moment ago that I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've started several successful companies, and that is true. I think working half days, isn't that everyone's goal to work half a day? Well, I've figured it out. I only work half days, but a day has 24 hours, so I work 12 hours a day. That's a half day. That's part of the secret right there. I don't have amazing hobbies like racing horses, motorcycles. So most of my life is focused on aviation, and it has been the last several decades, back from even when I got my pilot's license years ago. And so entrepreneurship is terrific, but we learn more from the failures. You've never heard of four companies that I started because they failed. And frankly, I learned more from those failures than the successes. But a fusion is a really cool company. 58 people, I think, all smarter than me. Why would the boss hire someone more stupid, right? So they're all smarter than me. And we work for 90% of the world's 500 largest aviation companies, ranging from military missiles to passenger aircraft, helicopters, and lately a lot of urban air mobility, electric vertical takeoff landing, eVTOL. And they're really exciting. Each one's designed differently. They have different computers, but the software is hundreds of millions of dollars to develop for each aircraft and then double that for certification. So many 
projects don't ever actually fly, not successfully. It's easy to build a prototype, much different to build a scalable working aircraft that can really fly legally with certification. And that's what my books are about and white papers. And I think there's four not so good books on the topic. I think maybe the worst two are mine. So I've written half of the books. There's only <laughs> four of them, you know, but it's a, it's a lot of fun and it keeps me busy. Wow. Quite impressive. I didn't know all these four ventures you mentioned, but that, in my opinion, makes it even more impressive, even more impressive because um, you seem to be a really busy man and, and you are also climbing mountains from what I heard. Indeed. Next week I'll be on Mount Everest. I'm not going to the top. I have no plan to go to the top. Uh, I do have a plan to make it halfway and that's where it gets difficult. So mm -hmm. I'll be, I'll be coming back, visit you in a month. <laughs> wow. Well, so before you start packing for your, your trip to the Himalayas, I think it would be a good time to discuss some of the most pressing topics now facing the industry when it comes to certification, because there are quite, uh, quite a few designs out there, not just EV tolls, but also other electric aircraft, um, hydrogen power aircraft. And each of them, not all of them, but most of them are introducing some real novel technologies and It seems that there's a lot of hype, but the reality is that in order to be commercially viable and feasible, all of these designs will need to be certified eventually. And here is where I would like to um, mm -hmm. have a word with you to get a bit of uh, your insight about how do you think this is going to work? I mean, do you see the industry addressing the issue of certification in a, in a proper way? What do you think are going to be the main, the main obstacles, for example, when it comes to EV tolls? And what would be, in your opinion, the steps that these companies would need to follow in order to get their aircraft certified? Oh, Miguel, that is a great question. And to summarize quickly, I think it's a very strong no, N-O, no, we're not doing it the right way. Okay? okay. It's so easy, again, to build that prototype. Well, it's not really. People think it's most of the work making a flying aircraft. And it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of skill. But the certification, which means it's airworthy, which means the probability that people can die on that aircraft, the aircraft will crash, has to be virtually zero from a mathematically provable standpoint. And most of our listeners today are in countries where they're innocent until proven guilty. Well, that's not aviation. Aviation is the opposite. We're guilty guilty of not building a safe aircraft until we can prove it's safe. We have to provide massive evidence, evidence that if we printed out all the documents and let's don't do that, let's save trees, please. It would fill up multiple Boeing passenger jets, just the documentation for certification. So it's a massive undertaking, EV tall, electric aircraft, they're different. Today, here we are in late 2022, there's only one certified electric aircraft and We at Effusion are proud to have helped Pipistrel in Slovenia and Italy to have done that. They bought our frameworks, our training, our mentoring, our processes. We helped out. But it's such a massive undertaking. They're the only all-electric aircraft, and they use runways. We had the founder of Pipistrel here on the podcast oh. uh, uh, about a oh, year ago. Oh, he's terrific. Yeah, Terrific. Had, What a Mr. great gentleman. Ivo Boscarol, yeah, it was a, a fascinating yeah. conversation because he he was already trampling with aircraft in in the in the days when uh, Slovenia was part of Yugoslavia and it was completely different It's... political landscape in Europe. Yes. Uh, but <laughs> they were kind of the uh, already working on the, on on the first like let's say homemade aircraft at the time. Uh, that was quite a story. Exactly. But, It's uh, really cool. He's a great gentleman, and yet. That aircraft is very successful, built on a existing previous Pipistrel design, but all electric, so very cool. Well, now with eVTOL, we have to go much further, much, much further. Pipistrel helped define what's called the certification basis over at EASA, European Aviation Safety Agency, kind of equivalent to the USA's FAA. So we need special rules. Imagine building a house and then building a commercial building in an earthquake zone. There's different construction techniques. There's different safety techniques we have to use. We need fire escapes, sprinkler systems, anti-vibration for earthquakes. Well, it's a different use case, a commercial building versus a house. Well, the same thing's true with eVTOL. They can fly anywhere. They don't need, you got it, runways. We'll have pilots probably with less experience. We'll be mixing with commercial airspace, landing in high-density urban areas. 
we'll be using batteries that, well, batteries are never perfect. We've seen, and Tesla, we all love Tesla, Elon Musk. Occasionally there's an accident. There's a, a fire. Well, what happens going up and down with a electric aircraft for emergency procedures? How do we switch over to a backup battery system using a, a very complex battery management system? The displays, the alert, everything is slightly different. And Europe is a little bit ahead of the USA. Europe, EASA has done a really good job lately of helping to advance the uh, new technologies. FAA is lagging a little bit, but they're catching up. They're all defining new rules. We have to be like the United Nations and come together, have a common set of rules, but those rules are not yet fully defined. There are no fully certified eVTOL aircraft. We got some that are getting closer. They think they're a year or two away. Oh, no, no, no. I'll be happy to take bets 10 to 1. That's right. Okay. I'm paying 10 to 1. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, many of these uh, companies are aiming for, a, let's say, a time window to get their first flights and even the first commercial services uh, between 2025 and 2030, most of them even earlier more towards the uh, the earlier part of this of this time frame do you think that's too tight in terms of time it, it's going to take more more time to get it done it's a great question i think most of those companies need to double their time and double their budget there's a few companies who are predicting end of 2024 it's those that i think are too aggressive i think that 2025s are too aggressive i do th i'm positive we're going to have certified flying aircraft in 2028, 2029, 2030. But that's four and a half, five years away from now. It's mm -hmm. going to take at least three years away, I believe. Yes. Yeah. And what what is the process like? I mean, what I, I understand this is a very complex process, uh, very complex process. And um, I wouldn't get too much into the into the to the small details, but in, in rough lines, uh, from the moment that a new aircraft design is conceived until the moment it's certified. Um, what are the main milestones that it needs to uh, follow, uh, it needs to reach? Great, great question. If it's a existing aircraft like Pipistrel, for them, the path was much easier, much shorter. Even though it was complex, they use an existing aircraft. Well, there is no existing aircraft designs for these EV tolls. So it's two to three times longer right there. Imagine building an all new type of building. Well, a local government needs to approve the plans and then inspect that building. They look at that building to see how the steel is poured in the concrete, how the electrical lines, the joints are made, all of those things during development. You just can't build it and then certify it. So it's a handshake back and forth like a relay race, but with hundreds of hurdles, hundreds of handoffs. And it's a very tedious process. So there's a full set of documentation of plans, of standards, guidelines, checklists that have to be sequentially followed. Now, we try to put some parallelism in there to speed up schedule, but there's still some sequentiality about it. And it's literally hundreds of steps. Many companies use a Fusion's frameworks out of the box to do that. And that doubles the uh, uh, speed, but it's still uh, several years to go through all those handshakes with the certification authorities. Mm -hmm. And does it involve as well, I guess, uh, let's say a, a physical phase where the aircraft is actually tested in different conditions, uh, flying conditions, landing conditions, different weather conditions as well? What's the proportion more or less between, let's say, the, the theoretic, well, theoretical, yeah. the, like the part where it's like paper based and the part that is actually on field testing and proofing the concept? Yeah, it's a great question. To oversimplify, it's about three years paper-based, followed by two to three years of actual development in a lab, in a hangar, and then about two years of test flying through all the envelope. You know, wind tunnel simulations can do much of it, but they're just theoretical. We have to actually determine the stall speed, determine maximum bank angle, maximum, you know, all the parameters. That's done by flight testing under many different conditions. And so generally three years, two years, two years, that's a total of seven years. That's an aggressive schedule. So if you have not started today, you're starting tomorrow, your goal would be to try to be certified in seven years. Good luck with that. Mm -hmm. And what, what about the cost? Ooh, 
add a zero to whatever you think. It's kind of like remodeling your kitchen, right? Mm, yeah, I can <laughs> well, imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just all the all the time it takes for that that one times ten to the minus seventh, that probability to show that it won't crash. That's a huge amount of of time and Building the prototype can be very fast. You can build a prototype. If you have a good idea and money resources, you can go from paper to flying a prototype out in the ocean, 160 kilometers away out in international airspace, take a boat out there. You can fly in a year. But to do the, the full route, like I said, that's a, a lot of paperwork, a lot of time. So most companies find that the entry cost is a minimum of 300 to 400 million dollars and it's easy to do translation to euros now it's the same yeah. so yeah the several hundred million dollars just to think about playing in this game it's like getting a football team in europe if you don't have an annual salary of 50 million euros you're never going to win a game well if you don't have a few hundred million dollars you're never even going to start ev now probably you want to add a zero to that. Probably it's going to be three or four billion dollars by the time you tool up, make your manufacturing. Now you spent half a billion with a B dollars. You've got to sell a few thousand aircraft to recover those costs. And so to build a factory, look at Tesla, what they had to go through. They weren't profitable for the first three years, but they had access to billions of dollars, right? Well, that's similar. And that's why the EV tall companies that are aligned with large manufacturers, some of the automotive manufacturers, some of the mass producers, maybe they have an advantage in my opinion. It's one thing to build a prototype, quite another to manufacture at scale thousands of aircraft to recover your cost to make a profit. Mm. Wow. That's a point where a company like a fusion can come into play. Uh, what do you guys do exactly? So you guide... Yeah. You guide the companies going through this process. At what stage do you um, basically uh, intervene? And in practical terms, what's your role? I mean, do, do you just provide guidance or you get involved as well in, in the process? Mm. So it's a great question. We are like doctors. And an Olympic athlete would have doctors to help them train to avoid injuries and get stronger. But they also need doctors after they've injured themselves. So an athlete would be well advised to hire a doctor before they started training and before they injured themselves. So the doctor can show them how to prevent injuries and that would be successful, but it's, you know, takes a little more proactivity. Effusions like that doctor, most of our clients use us to avoid the hospital. They come to us and we teach them how to certify their aircraft, how to perform the safety assessments still in the paper phase. They haven't started building yet. It's all about minimizing the changes, minimizing design, architecture changes, costs. Every time you change your architecture in a significant way, you basically restart that certification process, obviously. And so by using a Fusion's templates, our frameworks, our training, our mentoring throughout the process, that's the most beneficial. Having said that, Mikhail, probably 30%, about a third of our clients come to us very late. They didn't hear about us. Maybe they thought they could do it without a doctor. And now they're injured. They're behind schedule, over budget, and we try to help them out as much as we can. We're not as successful. It's much easier to prevent injuries than, you know, fix the broken leg. But we can fix broken legs, do brain replacements, heart transplants, whatever is necessary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I guess you are, you're not short of demand now because we're talking there, I think it's, it's been constantly updated, but I think the, the list of uh, EV tall startups was running into the hundreds, wow. into a six, 600 or 700. I lost count already because if we count all oh, of them wow. in a broad way, yeah. Mikhail, so, you're, you're 200 ahead of me. Uh, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> I thought it was about 450. Wow. No, <laughs> I, well, maybe it depends on how you count. Maybe I'm maybe the 600 number includes uh, not just TV tolls, but also other electric and, and hydrogen powered aircraft. But I think the list of new uh, airframe ventures was running into, I think it was well past the 600 mark. But maybe I'm, I, I will need to check the numbers awesome. again. But <laughs> awesome. Oh, it's, it's awesome. It's going to be a thousand. And, you know, if we remember American car manufacturers 80 years ago, Mm -hmm. There was many, many, 15 times more than today. There's not enough money 
for everyone to win. In business, usually the top one or two, they take about 80% of the profits. The next three or four fight over the next 20%. And everybody else loses money and goes away. So Indeed. it's all about that <laughs> getting that yeah. initial yeah. in it. How is this process organized in terms of categories and geography? So what I'm, I want to say here is like, okay, you've got the FAA, um, you've got the ASA in Europe. Now, do you need to start a process from scratch for each major jurisdiction or they kind of accept each other's certifications or there's some d Ooh. up to a degree of, yeah. of uh, let's yeah. say, of convalidation of, of what they, the others have done already? That's a great question. And the largest two certification entities are FAA and EASA. There's what we call a bilateral trade agreement. So in theory, an approval of certification airworthiness in one jurisdiction, North America, USA, applies over to Europe. But Boeing is a terrific company. You know, they if we look at their overall safety record, they've done a wonderful job. But that 737 MAX thing kind of set them back a bit. And now because of 737 MAX, it seems that EASA is putting a little more scrutiny on FAA certifications. Mm. And the FAA has raised the bar as well. The FAA has become more rigorous, uh, much more actually. <laughs> it's, you know, maybe some say it's overcompensating, but in general, you don't need to reset. They're not completely separate. You have good jurisdictions like uh, Transport Canada in uh, you know, Canada, several other countries, China's coming on strong with CAAC. Many other companies are emulating FAA EASA, and some even have bilateral agreements. But most of the eVTOL companies are building and certified in either Europe or USA. 90% of the world's eVTOL, even though they're located in dozens of other countries, they're selecting FAA or EASA simply because they're at the forefront of approvals and their approval will carry a lot of weight. Whereas we take a small country, Estonia or, or you know, um, gosh. Yeah, another Asian. jurisdiction that is not part of any any of these yeah. blocks could be like any, yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Saudi Arabia has, has mm -hmm. some great, great capabilities, but they don't have an official aviation certification agency. So even though they're building some great aircraft and uh, components there, to get certified, for example, in Saudi Arabia would not carry enough weight for Europe or FAA. So that's how it's working. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the different categories of, of aircraft? Because obviously there are different uh, types of certification for depending on, on the size and the capabilities of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. Roughly speaking, which are the main ones that are out there? Yeah. And, and where do eVTOLs fit in? <laughs> because I know... Recently, yeah. there was a the FAA issued some guidance uh -huh. um, changes. Yeah, and and basically there there was a bit of a, of a small earthquake in the industry uh, about this uh, this new yeah these new changes uh, by the FAA. Yeah. What does it mean for the EV toll industry? And what are the let's say the yeah the the, the main certifications mm -hmm. that apply now to all these many projects that are out there taking shape? Mm -hmm. I like to use analogies. People learn. Most sure. of our listeners. Yeah, maybe they're not aircraft experts, but they know about buildings. Obviously, if you build a building in Los Angeles versus Florida, well, L.A. had a nice earthquake last week. Florida had the horrible Ian hurricane, right? You build for different uh, risks. And if you build a large commercial building versus a storage shed, that's different. So what are you building from? Where is it at? What are the risks? how many people could die, et cetera. Those things dictate the building rules. It's the same in aviation. Essentially, there's four basic types of commercial aircraft. There's small fixed wing. It's called part 23. Large fixed wing is part 25. Small helicopters, rotorcraft, part 27. Large rotorcraft, part 29. Well, then there's different ratings within each category for what's its uh, complexity to fly. Does it have multiple engines? What's its speed? How much risk is there? Things happen much faster going 500 knots versus 100 knots. So there's a higher rigor for speed and complexity. So eVTOL are neither fixed wing or rotor. The USA took a easy streamlined approach. Most of the new aircraft are small, part 23 fixed wing. If we think about it, there's not a lot of new Boeings coming out every year. So the FAA wisely took the expedient easy route and said, let's just certify 
EV tall to part 23 standard Cessna Piper Mooney type uh, certification. He also took a different approach and said, wait a minute, you know, with a little French accent. No, no, mm-hmm. no. They said uh, <laughs> EV tall are a little different. They don't exactly use airports, different pilots. There's a different uh, risk profile. So let's have a special class, uh, special certification basis, it's called for EV tall. FAA said, nope, we're going to do it our way. And that's a problem. That means EV tall are now against the bilateral agreement. They're mm. not quite equivalent. Apples and oranges, right? Not apples and basketballs, but apples yep. and oranges. So yep. FAA says, okay, well, let's compromise a little bit. Let's change the rules and essentially raise the bar, increase the rigor for EV tall a little bit towards the way of EASA. So there's still a little gap, but it's it's different and it recognizes where EV tall fly, the charging aspects, the type of pilots, urban density, class AB airspace, that type of thing. So I think, Mikhail, we're a long way away from autonomous aircraft where there is not a pilot. We're a long way away from artificial intelligence in the cockpit that's actually flying. Mm-hmm. But we're it's going to happen in sequences. I think we're going to see EV tall first in planned airspace. In Europe, they have a name for it. It's called U-space, the letter U, U-space. It's controlled, okay. heavily heavily regulated, lots of sensors, very hard to cause a crash. There'll be mm-hmm. radar, ADSB, TCAS, everything. And so but that's that the would, first step. Yeah. That would require, I guess, some some corridors like we're seeing now. Yes, some, exactly. Some EV corridors. I actually wanted to ask Only. you about, yes. about this, yes. like there 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 are a few well actually whisk is possible the i don't know if there are any other uh let's say realistic uh unmanned um passenger ev tolls out there mm-hmm. at the moment maybe i'm, I'm missing mm-hmm. someone else but whisk is possibly the most um mm-hmm. prominent example so i i was wondering whether that would fall under the same type of certification than the other aircraft that uh have a Ooh. pilot on board i guess that's a whole order of magnitude uh in terms of uh difficulty challenges of getting this certified it is it is and i think if we look at tesla you know the Tesla Model S is a terrific car, and Tesla's had great success, obviously. And they've got it because of that success, they, they're going to have a lot of competition. If you're in an industry without competition, it's probably because you're not going to make a profit. If you make a profit, you attract competition. Well, Tesla didn't start out with the, the Model S. We all remember the cool little Roadster. Now, Tesla didn't make money on the Roadster, it was a cool car. When you told people that we're making an electric Lotus, Everybody laughed and said, what is that? Well, oh my, don't we all wish we had bought a Tesla Roadster 20 years ago, right? Well, maybe that's the whisk approach, okay? Building something that is ahead of its time and that will allow whisk to leapfrog. And by the time they're really ready, maybe we'll have with FAA, not EASA, FAA, a little more of a certification basis towards autonomy. EASA has tighter airspace over in Europe tighter rules. Anybody who flies a a general aviation small aircraft knows it's not quite as fun to fly over in Europe as it is, say, in Texas, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, or Arizona, right? Yeah, actually, I've I've, I've got um, another podcast episode um, that I don't know if it's going to be published before or after this one. It recorded already. And we talk about precisely these type of things, like how in Uh, Europe there are certain areas that are uh, quite restricted, so that that's <laughs> oh, a big, yeah. that's something to take into account as well when when we talk about this evital revolution and all of that. But sorry, I interrupted yeah, yeah. you there. You were mentioning no, no. the differences between the U.S. and and Europe, also about the yeah, yeah. certification approach and and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and how some yeah. airspace is more controlled than others, etc. Yeah, I think the biggest problem, Mikhail, in 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 this, and it's a problem that has an easy solution. It's just not a sexy solution. People like sexy, cool solutions, and that's building the EV tall, building the autonomy. What is not sexy is all the gas stations. Okay. Think about it. Nobody talks, hey, I went to a cool gas station today, Hmm. yet it's something we visit much more than the car dealership, right? Well, how are we going to charge the aircraft? How are we really going to fly? Where are we going to take off from land? What are going to be the rules? What about the commonality between cities, counties, states, countries over in Europe, similar. Well, that is behind schedule. We, before 
Tesla can be successful, there has to be a way to charge them. Well, that's easy with a car. Everyone has an outlet. But to do useful traveling, you need access to charging stations. Well, same thing with UAV. We need access to that infrastructure. We are way behind. I would say three to four years behind where we need to be to have massive use of EV tall by the end of this decade. Mm -hmm. I see. And what about these recent changes uh, that introduced the FAA? I think they uh, basically made EV tolls more more similar to rotorcraft. Am I right? Is it right to say it this way? Um, I would closer than it was. It was pure fixed mm -hmm. wing, okay, before. Mm -hmm. But now it's a little closer to rotorcraft. Rotorcraft have rotorcraft have more flexibility in where they land, their flight uh -huh. profile. They're harder to track. They have mm -hmm. more flexibility. A Cessna cannot turn on a dime, for example. A rotorcraft can. Mm -hmm. A Cessna doesn't go 10 knots, well, unless it's headed straight down. Well, a rotorcraft can. So a lot more variation and pilot uh, nuances, if you will. So we're a little closer to the Part 27, the rotorcraft, small rotorcraft uh, certification phase. Mm -hmm. Because what are the main... Uh, elements to take into account when we are talking about the safety or potential mm -hmm. safety of EV tolls. Uh, what are the points, the potential points of failure that the manufacturers and the regulators mm -hmm. have to pay special attention at? Well, it's a good question. Right now, our, our viewers can't see. This is a podcast, not a webcast, but I'm holding up my cell phone right now. Uh -huh. And it's a good, good cell phone, but this cell phone could never operate for a million hours. That's six zeros, one, zero, 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 a million hours without a failure. No hardware can do that. We call that MTBF, mean time between failure. So we know there's no hardware capable of singly ensuring passenger safety. Well, watch this. I'm going to do a very dangerous experiment right now. Miguel, don't, viewers, okay. don't do this at home. Okay. Everybody <laughs> sit. Yeah, stay seated. Ready? One, two, three. I just unplugged my computer. I'm still talking. Miguel can see me. The computer, go Windows, go Intel, right? It switched over. Well, that's exactly what we have to do on eVTOL. Every hardware component has to be able to switching over independently. So you see, I have full independence on my computer, right? No, I don't. I only have one motherboard, one CPU, but the CPU has a higher probability, but even the CPU cannot operate for 1 million hours. So we need hardware, independent CPUs, different power source, different sensors. You can't have two uh, uh, power lines adjacent to each other because if you have a failure, a battery fire, heat, you lose redundancy. It's fake redundancy. Every, listeners, right now, look up at your ceiling. How many of you can see two smoke detectors? I can see four in my office right now. That is fake redundancy. All four of your smoke detectors are connected to the same electrical circuit. All four of your smoke detectors have the same design. If there's a design failure, you lose. So folks, right now, after this podcast, not right now, listen to the rest of this podcast. Okay, Mikhail mm -hmm. is fascinating. Yeah, do that. <laughs> you need, <laughs> exactly. You need to change your smoke detectors. You need to install a different manufacturer battery operator, but now you need maintenance instructions. Every month you got to test the battery, replace the battery, see, but you'll have true redundancy. That's mm -hmm. what we're doing on eVTOL. Not just the batteries, it's the flight control, the communication, the navigation systems, the, yeah, the, all the systems that relate to passenger safety. Now you've got very high voltage and current to power these multiple rotors. What happens if a rotor bursts and takes out an adjacent rotor? That can't happen. What happens if a passenger touches a metal fuselage part and there's a short from the battery? The passenger dies. That can't happen. So every aspect of these EV tall are going to be vastly safer than your car. Your car has evolved since Henry Ford or well, the French and Germans made cars before Henry mm -hmm. Ford, as you all know, over in Europe. Mm -hmm. That's 100 years ago. We're trying to take 100 years of automobile evolution and do in 100 years, five years. So we're going to have to do it very carefully. And all those safety aspects are fully considered. There's not a single millimeter on that aircraft that is not considered via a formal mathematical safety assessment 
And that's what a fusions 55 plus engineers all work on and help clients do that. So does that summarize? Okay, Mikhail. Uh, perfectly. So let's say I'm an eVTOL entrepreneur and I want to certify my aircraft the next sometime in the next five years. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I know that possibly you would tell me that's optimistic. <laughs> uh, it's not going to happen. But anyway, let's say let's say we we've done some previous work, and I expect yeah, yeah. this to to be ready like in okay. five to six years, something like that. Okay. So I okay. come to you, and what would be what would be the, the the what would be the steps that you would follow? Um, yeah. in, in practical terms, I mean, would you send people yeah. over to check all the documents? Uh, would you, or would you just take over all the documentation and take care of it? Uh, in practical terms, what, how does your, 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 um, advice materialize, uh, when you are dealing with, with these, uh, EVTOL entrepreneurs or with established industry players? Oh, great question. Well, if we think back to ancient times, you know, BC, right? BC, that's before COVID. So in ancient times, BC, before COVID, we did on-site visits. But these days, thanks to COVID, here we are. What are we? 12,000 kilometers away. Mikel and I have a yep, real-time side-by-side podcast. We do it remotely. So we would get the safety data and we'd ask that provider, that builder, show us the safety assessment data. Let's evaluate that. And if it's pretty good, we can just modify it and make it perfect. If they haven't got it, well, we could say, well, we'll need to do a safety assessment at the aircraft and then systems level. And we can assist with that or we can show you how to do it. So it depends how far along they are, how much of the process they followed. Hopefully, they've had training from either us or our competitors in the certification standards. So they made their design, they have the paperwork. They can show that they are innocent, so they're not presumed guilty. And then we can fill in all the blanks, either using our frameworks or theirs, if they're, if they're good enough to bring everything up to certifiability. And mm -hmm. we can also initiate conversations, processes with FAA, EASA, the certification agency. Mm -hmm. You on your website you mention uh, different aspects of your work. You talk about something go called gap analysis, and that yeah. got me wondering what what's gap analysis in this context. Ooh, it's a great uh, question. Just, we, yeah. One second, because we are yeah. getting to the forty minute. Uh, oh yeah. So I'm going to send you a new link, and we can just retake it when you tell me what's the gap analysis. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. One second. I'm going to switch this one off. You, you know. Uh, okay. Gap analysis. <laughs> very good. It's a great question, Miguel. We do about one gap analysis per month, maybe a little more, 15 or 20 per year, I guess. And the gap analysis assesses the gaps with where a company currently is on the road to certification with where they need to be. We look at the safety process, the planning process requirements of aircraft systems, hardware, software. We look at the design. We look at the actual implementation, the schematics, the mm -hmm. source code. We look at testing, configuration management. We look at quality assurance and certification, all the major categories. And we tell the companies where their gaps are, not to redo them, but to close them. Most companies do not need to start over. Very rarely do we have such a big gap, we say, you have to start over. It's kind of like training for competition. Certification mm -hmm. is like winning a medal at the Olympics. Not the gold medal, but you can win the bronze medal. You're still certified. But to win a medal, you need to have good training, good cardio, flexibility, strength, all of those things. Well, certification is the same way. You never have to start over. You just need to start exercising, eat better, sleep better, drink a little less alcohol, potato chips, right? Well, in certification, there's a lot of things we have to do better. And that gap analysis teaches companies how to close those. And companies can then close their gaps themselves. About half of our clients, they say, a fusion, why don't you come and help us close the gaps or just close them all together yourselves? And we can do that also. Mm -hmm. And how long is uh, your typical engagement with a customer? Ooh, 10% of them are just very basic training, mentoring, maybe a gap analysis. Another 20% are three to six months. And then the remainder, uh, 50, 60% are much longer. Companies realize 
we're not cheap. In fact, we're fairly expensive, but we're the most cost-effective solution. Mm -hmm. It's like, do we really learn how to overhaul our own car engine? We could do it. Our listeners are all smart. They could spend a few dozen hours and learn how to overhaul their car engine, spend the time, buy the tools, and then learn a very valuable lesson. They should never overhaul their own engine the first time. They should overhaul their friend's engine, right? Mm -hmm. But <laughs> it's the same thing with certification. Yeah. It's more efficient to have experts do it the first time. And most of our clients are first time, so they use us to do a lot of the engineering work. So those are about the percentages. It varies widely. Mm -hmm. And do you operate worldwide? So if a manufacturer yeah. is based in Europe, is based in Asia, uh, you would be able to assist as well with a certification? Absolutely. The only continent we have not assisted with is Antarctica. We're hoping okay. to get our first Antarctica, but we, have, we don't think that's likely. But we've done Africa, Asia, Middle East, Europe, USA. We have pr a presence in all of those places. We have distributors in Korea, Western Europe, Southern Europe, Middle East, uh, Japan. They have many clients active at any given time. Mm -hmm. And if people want to engage you uh, for a pro on a project, if they want to get a consultation, where should they go? And which channels oh. uh, do you have out there that they can check? Oh, great question. Many people find us on LinkedIn. They follow a fusion, A-F-U-Z is in Zebra, I-O-N. They mm -hmm. send an email to info at a fusion with a Z, or they simply uh, Google us and we're easy to find. So we, we return all phone calls, emails, and we're real easy to find. All Excellent. those things work great. Excellent. And, and just to wrap it up, um... I wanted to ask you about the books that you published. Uh, you, oh. you, you mentioned yeah. them earlier, but can you uh, tell us what, what's the reference? Uh, where can people find them? Are they an, on Amazon? And what, what's the what, what yeah. are the titles? Yeah, we're trying to be environmentally friendly. The, the first book was uh, about DO-178, which is the software guideline, and DO-254, which are the high hardware guidelines and anybody can google 178 book 254 book and you'll find us there and you can buy kindle versions on amazon the most recent book is called the aviation development ecosystem and it's mm -hmm. a large thick orange book very expensive to print i think it's about 80 dollars just to print it because it's got a lot of graphics color and pages but you can buy that on amazon kindle OK, uh -huh. it's like three to three dollars if you have a Kindle account yeah. or if you really want to print the paper. We don't encourage that, but you can buy it on our website. So just look for hardcover aviation development ecosystem. And we sell probably 20 or 30 of those every week from our website. Wow. Well, I guess if you are, as you mentioned earlier, facing a four, uh, 400, 500 million bill to get your aircraft certified you might as well invest eighty dollars in a <laughs> or, yeah. or, or three dollars yeah. for the kindle version to to uh at least get yeah. a, a good head start uh with this matter all right so, <laughs> indeed very well so thank you so much today for your time and i would i'm going to be posting links to all these references and resources that you mentioned so that people can terrific can find it and if people want to get um, to dig down the like the technical details, all these different certifications and and other technical aspects of, of what you guys do, uh, then mm -hmm. they they will have where to start, and they can reach out to you, and then you can take it from there. In the fantastic, excellent. Thank you very much, Miguel. So nice chatting with you. Likewise, thank you very much, and wishing you all the best for your upcoming trip to the Everest. That's gonna oh, be. Oh, thank you. I guess uh, one of those trips that you um, remember forever because it's, uh, I don't know, <laughs> it, it must be something really, really unique to be there on top of the world, oh, literally. It's kind of like the things, it's kind of like the first flight, you know, your first solo flight, getting your license. Mm -hmm. You know you're going to land, but you want to land safety. You'll always land because there's a thing called gravity. You yeah. can always climb Everest. It's about how you get back safely. The yeah. <laughs> I plan on being back safely and landing safely, Miguel. Thanks so much. You have a Excellent. great day.
Thank you very much. Thanks, Rico. Bye-bye. Bye. Before you go, and if you like this podcast, a quick reminder that it would be absolutely great if you could please give it a rating on Apple, Spotify, or whichever platform you are using, or recommend it to a friend or whomever might be interested. Thank you very much, and see you soon.